All right, in your Bibles, you probably, if you have your Bible, you'll probably have to look at the table of contents, but in your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. If you're using the device, you just go down to where it's J-O-N, it's John without the H. And, and here's the deal, for, for 16 of the next 17 weeks, we are going to be in this section of the Bible where they got all the Star Wars characters' names from. It's the Hezekiah, the Obadiah, and all the crazy stuff, all the stuff that we kind of... It's like the central part of your states, the flyover states. The minor prophets are like the flyover books of the Bible that we just like visit every now and again, and, and they get some references. Well, we're going to kind of dive into them, all right? We're going to, with, with the exception of like this series, uh, Jonah, because uh, we're going to spend three weeks, four weeks on Jonah. Uh, man, we're really going to be getting into to those. Uh, we're going to spend a, a Sunday per prophet, all right? So we start, though, Today with Jonah. Now that's not in order, okay? Uh, we're we're going to spend some time with 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 Jonah because here's the thing about this guy. Jonah's a prophet. He's a messenger. God gave him a word, as we're going to see. And and here's the thing: the word is go. Like like ninety five percent of our sermon today is going to be centered around that one thought. And and we've been praying, and I've been praying that what happens the next 17 weeks, is that we will be spurred on to action as we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. Like, and I don't mean just like the repetitive, the routine, I'll go to church 2.5 Sundays a month action. I, I, I mean like, God, where do you want me to go? And I'm going. And that is exactly what today is about in Jonah 1. And I've been praying all week that this message, not my words, not, not, not Michael, but this message about this man Jonah will spur you into action to do what God is calling, to do what God is commanding us to do. And so I want to remind everyone, okay, there is only one teacher in this room, and it's the Holy Spirit. Right, it's not me. I'm, 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 just, I'm just a voice for the Lord. And so I encourage you to listen to what God is commanding you to do today and what He might be calling you to do. This, this week I had a phone call, and I'll get more into the details of it, about a revival that's coming up. And the guy's like, man, you sure are making me feel guilty. I'm like, dude, this is the first time I've ever talked to you on the phone. I don't even know you. And I said, maybe it's not me making you feel guilty, but maybe it's, what you know about God's word is stepping on your toes, and you know you need to you need to respond differently than what you've been doing, right? I'm not here to make you guilty, right? I don't I don't ever use guilt. I try not to ever use guilt. Let me say it that way. I try not to ever use guilt as a tactic. But man, maybe if you're feeling guilty, maybe if you feel some some conviction, I pray for conviction in your lives often. Maybe it's the word of God speaking to you, and you need to be spurred on to action. So that's my prayer for you. All right, so some quick facts about Jonah. Uh, Jonah lived, the book was written uh, 793 to 753 B.C., okay, about that, that time period. Uh, the name Jonah means dove, all right? Not significant for anything. Uh, Jesus mentions four prophets in his recorded teaching. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah and Jonah. Jonah's a pretty big deal, right? If he got mentioned with those guys. Uh, Jonah served King Jeroboam of, of the northern kingdom, uh, which is Israel. And we're going to have the historical content of all that laid out for you. You know, David came along, and then Solomon came along, and then the kingdom split into a couple of different kingdoms. And we're going to talk about all that. And different prophets served different kings at different time periods. So we're going we're to talk about that. But Jonah served King Jeroboam of the northern kingdom. And here's the thing, their greatest enemy were the Assyrians. All right? Their capital, Nineveh. All right? So, here we go. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read the entire chapter. And then we can come back through it, walk through this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of, where's my glasses, Amedi, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it for their evil has, has come up before me. 
But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. He, he went to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. I stroke that look. There's a couple words, and this is one of them. All right. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. That hospitable word, that one too. Man. O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have you done as it pleased you? So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right, so let's break this down. We're going to walk through this. And, and we're not going to get as far as I want to, but we're going to do it anyway. All right, so now the word of the Lord, verse 1, came to Jonah. This is the very thing that makes Jonah a prophet. The word of the Lord came to him. There was a message. So you and I have access to the Bible. We get to tote it around in our pockets and everything, and we get to read it every time we want. That was not the case with Jonah, right? He had to receive the message of the Lord directly from the Lord and so the, the, the message came to him. And here's the thing about the word of the Lord that you and I need to know about. We cannot leave this room today without understanding this. The word of the Lord is always meant to be shared with other people. It is for my benefit and can change my life. But it is never for me to keep to myself. And when we have the Word, when we have this message from God, it is for the benefit in our lives, but it is always to be shared with other people. And I get asked this question, does God speak to you? Does God, does God speak to you? I'm like, absolutely God speaks to you. And I was like, that's a, that's a no-brainer. I even get asked, do you ever hear the audible voice of God? And if you don't, if you, if you don't hear the audible voice of God? I'm like, yeah. Every time I read the Bible out loud, I mean, God sounds like some, you know, hillbilly from Jackson County, Georgia. Grew up in the beer capital of the South, right? Arcade, Georgia. That's what, that's, what, that's what God sounds like. Every time I read God's Word out loud, I hear God's voice. God speaks to us through His Word. He's given us the very message that is useful, and we say this a lot, useful for teaching, for correcting, for training. Is to prepare God's people. That's, that's verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3. But God also speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Through, through the gentle 
nudges. We feel those convictions sometimes. God's like, man, I put my spirit in you. I've given my spirit to you to nudge you along. And of course, he speaks through the wise counsel of others. Of course, God speaks to us. He speaks to all of us as followers of Jesus. It's how he reaches us and how he gets our attention. My question, though, is are you distracted from hearing from God because of the of the the noise that is in your world? And are you are you distracted? Man, schedules keep us so busy. Schedules keep us on the go. And and, and there's so much pressure to to work commitments and family commitments that a lot of times regular quiet time with God is very sporadic. You know, it gets it's one of those habits or disciplines that, that gets ignored a lot of times. And not to harp on this, but our church attendance in America is about two times per month for the regular people. Our participation in life groups and that 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 secondary hour of the week of, of church programming, and I hate to use that word for our life groups, is less than two times per month. Where does hearing from God rank as a priority in your life? I mean, is it just something that I just kind of flippantly live my life and when God speaks to me, I'm like, oh, okay, that was kind of cool. Yeah, I'll do it. Or are you waking up every day and I need the air I breathe and to hear from the Lord? What kind of priority do you place on hearing the message of God for your life. And he says, verse 2, Arise. You've got this message now. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city. I'm telling you, church, right here, here's the sermon. Go. Go. I mean, I don't know every single one of you in this room, obviously, but I know a lot of you really, really well. And you know it. We, we talk about this all the time. Go. It's the same word. It's just used in a different language, Hebrew, as it is in Aramaic that Jesus uses to tell His disciples to go. To submit to Jesus does not mean to submit to salvation only, but to submit to the going and being available to do His work. In God's economy, going is super duper important. But going is never only about the destination. But it's about the faithfulness of the person who God has commanded to go. You're going to hear that a lot in this sermon. Church, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be saved right now, you need to know that you are sent. You're sent. And you don't get to argue that. I'll prove that in a minute. Jesus told His disciples after the resurrection, you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem. Local, right here. You're going to be My witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You're going to testify because you have a message, disciples, on My behalf before others. And you're going to do it right here. And then some things are going to happen and you're going to be, you're going to be scattered. You're going to, you're, going to, you're going to leave here and you're going, to, you're going to have to go into the different regions. You're going to go all throughout North Alabama. You're going to be spread throughout the South and some of you even to the ends of the earth. Now, I, I started, I started, and I haven't finished this, so it's not complete yet, but I started thinking about all the Bible stories and characters. Okay, so don't hold me to this. But I came up with two right now where God did not send people. I got Job. I don't, I don't remember that where, where he had to go anywhere. That's a story about his life and what happened. And, and I don't remember Adam and Eve. They got kicked out, but, but they weren't commanded to go somewhere. Probably Cain and Abel. They're, they're, they're stories, but I'm telling you right now, there's a lot more stories that we read and study that have to do with going and being sent. And so as followers of Jesus, we're commanded to go. And this is a reoccurring theme this entire year. I shared this with you January 8th, so you got no excuse to keep hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it. We started the year with Isaiah, right? Where God asked the question, who's going to go for us? 
And Isaiah is so moved by who God is. By what God has done in Isaiah's life. He's so moved. Isaiah says, I, here I am. Send me. I'll go for you, God. Church, God expects us to get off our tails and to go. You know what we do? We run like running. I mean, we don't like run down to, to Joppa, buy a ticket, but we're going to talk about your boat in a minute. We make excuses. We make excuses. God, I'm not qualified. I promise you when I tell you what I got to tell you about, uh, about Nineveh, Jonah wasn't qualified. In just a second, I'm going to tell you, oh, I see why Jonah ran. Heck yeah, I'd be running too. We play this game with God all the time. We make excuses. We're not qualified. Or I don't, I mean, I don't have the time. I think God's economy, going is never only about the destination. It's about the faithfulness of the person who God is commanding to go. He commanded you and I to go. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have a choice. And so verse 2 then says, go. Where is he supposed to go? He's supposed to go to Nineveh, this great city. Now, Nineveh is the capital of Syria. Okay, uh, There's another prophet that we're going to study in a few weeks, Nahum. Right? Uh, he calls Nineveh a city of blood. All right, so that kind of gives us a, a a little bit of a description from someplace else in the Bible about about Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh is known for its uh, genocidal, ruthless group of people who love to torture their captives. They love to kill people, like that was their thing. You know, you go to Vegas, Sin City. It's all about the gambling. It's all about the nightlife and everything. Nineveh is like, man, we don't need lights. We don't need neon lights. We're just gonna kill you. That's what that's what we want to do. And it's not gonna be pleasant. It's not gonna be quick mercy killings. Killing. We would go and we would capture as many people as we, as we could. We would bring them back to our place and then we would just torture them. Like dismemberment. They love dismemberment. I read more than one story. I'm laughing. I'm sorry. I should do this. I read more than one story this week about one of the practices in, in Nineveh as they would capture you is they would save one hand. Right? And then they would like, they would like be shaking your hand. Like, like we would have a guy like, like we would be gradually, you know, how we would greet one another, men, shake hands, nice, firm. We would have one guy that would just be shaking your hand. And they would start cutting off parts of your body. And they would start at the feet, and they would just go to the joints, and they would work up. And it was all so that they could be shaking your hand as you entered into the afterlife. Ruthless. They would skin people alive. They, they, they would literally tie you up and they would split you down from the back of your head in your scalp all the way back down to the backside down there. They would do the same thing on your legs and, and they would literally peel the skin off of your body. And, and they got so good at it that they would then hang these skins up on their mighty... They had a hundred foot wall around Nineveh. They would, they would display these skins on the walls. So when you visited Nineveh, you'd be like, this, what's up with the artwork up here? This, this to me is the worst. They would cut the tongues out of mom and dad's mouth. And then they would burn the kids alive with the parents watching. Just so the parents would be in complete torture, not even being able to grunt and moan because of the pain of not having a tongue. They would watch their kids burn slowly. And I could go on, but I think you get the point. And Jonah didn't want to go, right? I mean, that's like the understatement of the year. Jonah did not want to go to a place that has a reputation for being genocidal, for being ruthless, torturous. He didn't want to go there. It, it kind of makes you going down the hallway in your workplace or down the street to your neighbor. It kind of 
kind of makes that not seem so bad right now, doesn't it? Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. You notice a couple things there? Tarshish, repetition, it's important. Presence of the Lord, important. So where Jonah is, when he received this message, he's about 500 miles by land to Nineveh. You're not getting there by sea. There's one way to get there. That's that's to get in the car and drive. All right. That's that's the, the, we, we're going cross country. So what does Jonah do? See if this relates. If you if you relate to this at all in your life, he travels 50 miles south to the sea town of Joppa. And he decides that he's going to flee to Tarshish, which is 2,500 miles the opposite direction of Nineveh. It's like God telling you to go to Charleston, South Carolina. No good way to get there but drive. Go to Charleston, South Carolina, and you're like, I don't like Charleston, South Carolina. I think I'm going to go to Seattle. That's, that's what it's like. God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh. And here's the thing that we got to know, church. We rarely get called to do God's will because it's comfortable. Like, I, mean, I, want you, I want you to think about that. that. There's not a lot of comforting ghost stories in Scripture. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of stress. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of factors that, 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 that are part of this go in God's economy. Comfort is never one. You know what we do for comfort? We schedule for comfort. We, we want comfort in our lives. By golly, if, it, if, if, if it's too cold in here and you're uncomfortable, you know what you do? Poor Miss Margaret. She wears gloves. Okay, it makes me feel bad in here. She put gloves on. But you know what? She doesn't complain about it. I'm well. I'm off. I'm all right. She doesn't complain about it. She just puts gloves on. She comes to church. The rest of you, man, if we crank it up and we turn it up so the Miss Mar- Mar- Margaret's warm, then I get this. And y'all don't just fan yourselves, okay? You don't just, whoop. you're like, you know. I mean, we had somebody in here at the Shader meal. It was just like, 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 just, whoop. I'm like, golly, it's not an iceberg in here. It's like 71 degrees. We're all about comfort, man. Like, 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 we, we go out of our way to be comfortable. God rarely calls us to the comfort. Because in God's economy, going is never only about the destination, but about the faithfulness of the person who God is commanding to go. Do I trust God's provision as I go? Nineveh, that's a bit extreme, God. And, and, and Jonah, notice, doesn't have a conversation with God. He doesn't cry out or pray to God. He takes matters into his own hands. He justifies his own thoughts, his own actions. He's willing to part with his own money because fleeing from God is going to cost you something. He goes down the opposite direction to Joppa, buys the fare, and where does he go? He goes down to the bottom of the ship. Why? Because I'm trying to hide from God. Oh, yeah. Not Michael. I've never tried to hide from God, praise the Lord. I've never tried to put God as far out of my mind when I know I'm doing things that I'm not supposed to be doing. So Jonah paid the fare. He boarded the boat. He went down into it. And, And here's the thing. We know this to be true. There will always be a boat to take us away from God's desire for our lives. There's always a boat. There's always a something. There's always a reason to not do what God has commanded us to do. Look, I'm, I'm look. Some of y'all have heard this story before, but I got to share it because this is my one of my this is one of my Jonah moments. I felt called by God to go into the ministry the summer of my senior year of high school. Graduated. 
high school, didn't want to work on my farm. I confessed this a couple weeks ago. And so to get out of work on the farm with my dad, the only thing that he would let me go do is church camp. So I'd go to church camp. And I'd do as much things, many things at church camp as I could. Right? And so I've graduated high school. Not even supposed to be at camp anymore because, you know, it's for seniors down. I go to camp anyway, felt God called me into the ministry. Enrolled in Atlanta Christian College, got that taken care of. My first year there, going to be a minister. That's what God called me to do. Go into the ministry. I got there. I started out strong, man. I started out strong. Going to class, doing all the class stuff. You had to go to chapels. Okay? You had to go to chapels twice a week. I do. I think it was twice a week. I'm not 100% sure because I made it like to four chapels the entire first semester. I actually paid a girl, Shannon, to sign my name into the chapel attendance thing. Literally lying about going to chapel. All right? And I'm there to go into the ministry. But I was there about a month. I mean, we made it, like school started in September. We made it all the way to, you know, like Halloween. And here it goes. I'm not so much focused on the college life and everything. I'm focused on me. And Amanda, because she was there, and she was not part of this equation just yet, she would say, and girls. So I was focused on me and girls and having a good time. And in our church society, just so you know, that's code for me. I was living in sin. And I justified it. I'm <laughs> like, man, God want me to do this, right? It's not that big a deal. Satan used that first year to convince me that maybe I'm supposed to do something else with my life. But somehow, the school, the administration, because they didn't know about all the, the having a good times that I was having, they selected this guy to be on a public relations team where we would travel around the South to different church camps and we would advertise and we would recruit for the school. I was on the PR team for Atlanta Christian College, right? And I had, I had one job. Now you go to these camps, you represent the school, you represent God, and you recruit people to, to come to the school, right? That, that was it. And I'm like, well, I'm still coming back to school the next year because I was playing basketball, and I would get a scholarship for doing this, and it was, again, it was a lot easier than going back home and working on the farm. I'll go to church camps for the rest of my life if I can get out of, you know, picking up dead chickens and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so, absolutely, sign me up. What do I have to do? You just have to represent God and represent the school well. I can do that, okay? And so, at the beginning of each week of camp, man, we would be introduced. You know, you got 60, 80, 100, whatever the kids is, and they'd introduce all the all the adults there and who they are. And part of our introduction was that, hey, we got a team from Atlanta Christian College. They're going to be working with you, a bunch of college students. We would have to kind of tell our degree what we were pursuing in the ministry. And so I'm like, hey, youth ministry, because I, I love kids and I don't want to work with adults. So youth ministry is, is God's sense of humor just flows through my life, all right? And, and I still do, by the way. I Man, I'd much rather be a youth minister, but that's another conversation for another day. No offense to anybody in the room. So we were supposed to tell the campers about how much fun being a Christian college student can be. But I'm like, well, I can't share about how I have fun because it's not what they want. And so then we were to recruit them to come to Bible college. And I did that for three consecutive weeks in which then my tone changed. As I'm in turmoil because I've spent the first year living it up and partying and focusing on who? Me. And so... Instead of saying, I'm here representing Atlanta Christian College and I hope to be a youth minister, about week four, I'm like, yeah, Atlanta Christian College is a good school and I'm undecided about what I want to do. I'm not sure. And like my PR team, they're there. There's Daryl Portwood and Chris Weldon, Jennifer Parker, and they're like, like, what did he just say? And I'm like, yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know what I'm going to do. And so I start doing this week after week. After a week, and after a couple of weeks of this, I get a phone call. Robert McGuire. He's the man that oversees the public relations department at Atlanta Christian College. And he's like, um, so we're getting some things that you don't even want to be a minister. Which is all well and good, but part of the selection process was that you're going to recruit kids to come do ministry and we wanted people who were committed to this and now. So it's like, what's going on? 
right? And and I, I love Bob. He could he would just shoot straight with you. I'm like, I don't know, Bob. I came here to do this thing. You know, I just I don't know if I want to do this. I don't. And and here's what I did. I mean, I I, I sat in his office, and there's ministers on campus. There's guys. Around. I don't want to be one of these guys. I don't. I don't. I, I don't relate to these these guys. Y'all are training up, and I don't. I don't want to be one. He goes, well, look, we got a kind of a dilemma here. You're kind of under a contract to do this job this certain way. If you want the money, you, you need to honor it. And so basically he was saying, fake it till you make it or lie. All right? I mean, that's, that's, that's what he was doing. So I spent the rest of the summer doing that. Just, just pretty much saying, hey, I'm go youth ministry. I'm here for youth ministry, right? But in my heart of hearts, man, I was like, I, I don't want anything to do with this. And so I went to my se- sophomore year. And and I, and I did the thing, and I walked through the process, and and I just lived for me, all the more, all the more, all the more. And by halfway through, at least I had a wonderful, you know, distraction in my life, sitting sitting right over here, and I say that with in positive manner, like she was ready. Where I met her, I walked away. The boat. Port suffered. And I bought the sail. I stepped right on. And I started living for me. God's like, man, I've called you into the ministry. And I, and I really and truly think you need to be in the ministry. And that was that 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 wasn't like bad tacos or something at church camp. I mean, that that was there was an incredible peace about this. I was like, this is what I've called you to do, Michael. And, and Michael's like, well, there's a boat over here going in a different direction. I think I'm going to take that boat. What I wanted was more important than what God wanted. And for five years, and God let me drift at sea. And the storms, they weren't that bad. I mean, like, you know, they, 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 we didn't feel like anything was happening. Life was not that bad. You know, enrolled at school, got a great job, married, traveled a lot. And we stayed involved in church. You know, we, we still kept, we kept God a priority because we went to church. And then it happened again. Some of you have heard this story. At a church conference, Louisville, Kentucky. See that? I mean, look, I didn't just like flee for you, God. I'm like, yeah, I'll go to the church conference, Louisville. Kentucky, Southeast Christian Church. I mean, I've, I've had Bob Russell over to my parents. I've had him over to our house before. I know the guy, sure, we'll go up there to the conference thing. And so we go up there to the conference thing and we're doing the thing. And and, and it's, it's you know, three days of pumping you up, pumping you up, pumping you up. And you're like, yeah, God, God's awesome. Right? And we talked about the whole mountain thing. God reveals his glory on the mountain. And, 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 and I'm sitting here and I'm riding back. And there's seven or eight of us in this 15 passenger church van, the regular church fans y'all know about. And I'm sitting in the very back row. And we're sharing. David Simpson's driving. And, and, and there's Rose Riddle and John Simpson, some other people there. And everybody's just like, man, this is what God said to me. This is what God said to me. This is what God said to me. And I'm back there pouting. I'm like, son of a kidding me? Because there was this conviction. Everybody else is like, rah, rah, go, go, go. And I'm like, thank God. Because it, it was it was this conviction of Michael, these things you're supposed to be doing. So they asked, Well, Michael, how about you in the back row? What what what'd you take away? You're awfully quiet. Nothing. Hey, just all right, it's all right. What no big deal. Whatever. They just a big church, a lot of money. That's all they are. Right? Inside and out core of what I was supposed to be doing. And even though it was not like this raging sea, I was fleeing from God. And for another six months, I wrestled with God. And then the wind started to pick up. All the success at UPS. Every, everything as I'm climbing that corporate ladder and got this promotion and got this promotion and then got the third promotion. Hey, we're, we're on strike and I'm crossing the picket line. I'm showing up to work. I don't care. I'm doing everything at UPS and things are just 
falling out for me and I'm on the fast track and life is great. All of that stopped. Things started to fall apart. And this conviction of I want you in the ministry does not go away. I can't escape the thoughts. Then it gets to where I can't even sleep at night. There's always a boat. Because I'm telling you right now, I was making more money then at, at, at 24 than I am right now at, at 48. I, and I, I'm like, man, I can't do this. I can't leave this lifestyle. I can't leave all of this right here. That's my boat. Not telling force there, sorry. But, that, but that, that, that's, that was my boat at that point in time. I'm telling you, church, there's going to always be a boat to take us away. Because we're commanded, here we're shifted. We are all commanded to go make disciples. We don't hide that here. And some of you have heard this message come out of my mouth for 12 plus years now. Life Ridge is only 11 years old, so y'all get to figure that one out. And we've got boats to keep us from doing it. We got reasons and the some things to keep us from committing to being in discipling relationships. Let me ask you, church, which of these commands are optional? All right, you, you tell me which of these are optional. Do not commit adultery. Do not lie. Honor your mother and father. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not covet your neighbor's stuff. Remember the Sabbath. Love your neighbor as yourself. Which of those are optional? Well, if you've grown up in Sunday school, you know you're going to say not a one of them. None of them are optional. All of them are taught in the Bible and we're to obey the commands. Then why do we treat the command, go make disciples, Jesus gave us the model for this, by the way, as an optional command. I just haven't been called to that. You have been commanded to go and do this. But what's your boat? What's your boat? What's the thing that's keeping you from going to build the relationship with the neighbor down the street? Who you know doesn't have a healthy relationship with the Lord? What's the boat that's keeping you from inviting your one more that I know you're faithfully praying for to life group this week? Or just to come over to dinner at your house maybe? What's the boat that's keeping you from that? Because here's the thing, to go in response to God's command is going to disrupt your normal life. Heads up, if you didn't know that, it's going to disrupt your life. Because Jonah, I'm pretty sure, was pretty comfortable doing whatever it is he was doing. You cannot live life the way you want to, doing the things that you want to and be obedient to God without some disruption. Because here's what we do in our, in, in our society. We try to cram things into our current life. And, and I'm telling you right now, I've done this thing 20-something years now. The very first thing that when life gets cluttered, okay, and when, when things get hectic, the very first thing that gets cut out are the things revolved around the church setting. Got a revival coming up in the next few months. So I've been talking to some of their church leadership, and, and they want me to preach. And so as I've talked to them, I don't even know where. where like this, I got two poss. I got one definite two possible. And and on this particular, I'm like, I don't even know where in Mississippi this place is. So I, I know nothing about this place. And I'm calling and I'm talking to their church leadership, and they're like, Well, we want you to preach on what our next step should be. And I'm like, so I asked the question. I'm like, well, what was your last step? And they're like, excuse me? And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, if you want me to tell you what your next step is, tell me about your last step. Because because I don't, I don't know you since we're using this terminology. And so they gave me the rundown of things that they used to do before COVID versus the things that they do now. Oh, yeah, you know, we used to have Sunday school, but we don't do that anymore. We used to print bulletins. We don't do that. I mean, that was literally one of the things that they did. We don't print bulletins either. Um, and, and I'm like, okay, so you're talking about your last step had to do with the program of the church and printing bulletins, and we don't pass communion anymore. We do the little, the little packet thing. 
So I asked, I was like, so you, you're doing all the stuff, the, the, all the church things, but you're not getting the results that, that you think you should. Is that right? He was like, no, we're not. So we just kept talking. And then this guy brought it up. These were the exact words. Tell me about this discipleship thing I've heard you do. And so we have, we, we, we have a decent conversation about this. They're putting me up in a casino, by the way. Just, just, for, just for transparency's sake, I just want y'all to know about this. All right, just in case something happens. They are putting me up in a, in, in a casino. So um, we'll make sure we hand the church credit card over before we, before we go on this. So, so, so we had a lot of conversation, and it ended with this thought. Thanks, Bill. Bill, discipleship cannot be done without you going. I said, and from our conversation, the things that I've heard you say, uh, you, you'll take time off of work. You, you will literally take time off of work so that you will go to your nine-year-old's flag football game. It's not even real football. It's like playing soccer. Right? Like you'll take time off work and you'll, you'll go to that, which being there for your kids is important. But let me ask you this, Bill. If I lived in your community, would you be willing to take time off of work to meet with my son to help him walk with him in his faith journey. Would, would, you, would you miss work to help my son in his faith journey? And he was like, what are you even talking about? But man, that, that, that's what it takes for discipling and to go as Jesus commanded us to go. It doesn't happen without disruption in our lives. And it doesn't happen without sacrifice. And, and I asked him, and I said, how many weeks of vacation do you get? He said, I get five. And, and I've got about 20-something personal days accrued as well. And I'm like, well, how do you, I want to accrue some personal days. How do you do that? I said, are you willing to go to one of the missionaries that your church supports? Are you, are you willing to go to them? And I don't even know who your missionaries are, but are you willing to go to them for seven to ten days and encourage them and support them and build relationship with them in person? He's like, I don't have time for that. And I'm like, dude, you just told me you had five weeks of vacation and 20 some odd personal days of cruise. What do you mean you don't have time for that? He goes, well, those are vacation days. The thought of sacrificing weeks worth of vacation time for this was completely foreign to this elder at a church. I'm like, Bill, if you are going to be obedient to the command of Jesus to make disciples, and I wholeheartedly believe everyone in this room who hears my voice right now needs to be either discipling somebody in relationship or they need to be discipled by someone, then you have to go. And it will not happen without disruption in your life. Why? Because in God's economy, going is never only about the destination, but about the faithfulness of the person who God is commanding to go. So what did Jonah do? He paid the fare. He went down into it. To go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. I love verse 6. And the mariners were afraid, and he cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it up for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, O God? Arise! Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give will give a thought to us that we may not perish. I'm telling you right now, there's so much more. We literally got, have gotten through half the sermon today. So there's so much more that I want to cover in this, but I want you to know verse 6 is our response. I, I, I just, it just hit me Thursday afternoon. Verse 6 is, is, is what I hope you walk out of here with. Arise. Call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought. Now, our God, church, you know it. You know, he ain't no lowercase G God. 
right? And he's the sovereign God of the universe. Man, if you've been running, you've been running from the presence of the Lord, you're a sleeper right now, not asleep as nobody's done today. Good job. But if you're a sleeper in your faith, if you're a sleeper in, in, in ignoring what God is commanding, arise. Which means wake up. And I'm asking you when you walk out of here today for this and this only, will you call out to God and what you're to do? Now next week, man, we talk about it. We, we, we get into the whole rescue mission. God literally sent a fish because, I mean, they threw Jonah over. And if you don't know anything about where Jonah lived, he lived in a desert. And so swimming lessons were not readily available at the YMCA. The fish was not punishment. The fish was a rescue. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about the repentance side of things. And that come to your senses moment, and I'm praying for you, church, that it is now. Because the thing that is lacking, the thing that is lacking is us going. I, I was asked this, I was literally asked this very question by somebody about two weeks ago. What do you want from your church the most? Double in attendance? I'm like, no. I want, to dis I want to double the number of people who are committed to making disciples. Man, if we, if we don't have, if we, if we don't add another member to Life Bridge, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But I lose sleep. All this gray, all this gray is the, from the, the from the sleep I lose about the people committed to making disciples the way Jesus modeled for us. The kingdom's going to take care of itself and the kingdom's going to grow. All right, when we live that out. Because you want to know the cool thing about this? Huh? You want to know the cool thing about this whole story? Is the mariners who were crying out to their little G gods who had no idea who, who our sovereign Jehovah God is, you want to know what happens to them? They, they start making sacrifices to God. Once Jonah is broken, once Jonah gets to the point of, man, throw me over. It's my fault. I'm running from God. Once Jonah had the moment, the people on the boat around him made vows of, of committing relationship to the Lord, made sacrifices to God. It was in Jonah's obedience that people came to the Lord. And so, guys, that takes care of itself. Our responsibility is not bringing people to the Lord. Our responsibility is going. That's our responsibility. So let me give you two quick implications, and then we're done. Y'all see Caleb up there. All right, first off, you've got to know this. God speaks to us via His Word, the Bible. It's the number one thing that you could have in your life are you missing it because of the noise and the distractions of life? That, that's up to you. I don't know. Why you read it, how you read it. But are you missing what God is saying to you because of the distractions of life? That's implication number one. You think about that. Number two, you've got to walk out of here knowing that God rarely calls us to the comfortable. I know a minister, This is. I thought about this in relation to this story. I know a minister from Monroe uh, that we used to do stuff with. His name's Ken. He worked with one of the Baptist churches. <laughs> they do their mission trips and they're planting churches in the French Riviera. <laughs> wow. Sign me up, right? Like, help, help me out. Which, ironically, is like very close to Tarsus. <laughs> Understand. Going. It's not always about boarding a plane and flying somewhere else. Going might be going down the hallway at your work. It might be going over to that other baseball dad. It, it, it might be going 
to the person on your line where you, where, where you work? Are you willing to go to trust Him? Because as followers of Jesus, we're to live simply. God, we love you. We thank you for a story that we turn into like nursery stuff and we do a lot with this story in, in our churches. And we love to reenact the belly of the whale and all of those things, which is really cool. All that's great, God. But at the core, Jonah was getting on a boat fleeing you. But I, I pray that that's not true about any of us. God, we've all run. I just pray that we're not going to keep running. I pray that we're willing to say, all right, Lord, whatever, whatever in my life needs to be disrupted to go. Nineveh was a terrifying place to even consider walking into. You never call us to the comfort. So, Lord, I, I pray that our faithfulness will be on display as we submit to the command of go. We love you, God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace.